But here we go. People ask me when I decided to remain single. I know exactly the moment. It was about two decades ago and my friend Rick told me, Abe, he said, Abe, I, don't, I didn't know what real happiness was until I got married, and then it was too late. <laughs> That's when I decided I'm going to be single. Just, just kidding. <laughs> Take a look at some of the recent statistics of those over 18 years of age. The percentage of those who have been married is dropping in the last 50 years. The percentage of those who are unmarried has been rising. And of this latter group, the never marrieds also are going up in number. While the numbers for the widowed and divorced uh, have remained pretty much constant. All that to say there are about 100 million unmarried adults in the U.S. who are 18 years and older. This makes it vital for any Christian, Christian individual, Christian organization, Christian ministry, to comprehend what it means to be single and the context in which I'm speaking about what it means to be single and Christian. So today I'd like to tackle what it means to be a single Christian apart from the possibility of marriage. And at the same time, I want to bring to your attention three core elements of celibacy that are also at the core of the gospel. And then we'll take some time for questions. Before we get any further, let me just do some definitions. There are many different kinds of singleness. There is vocational singleness, where because somebody is consumed by a career, one decides to stay single. There's ideological singleness that sees marriage as an outdated and oppressive institution, as exemplified by the feminist Gloria Steinem, who once said, a woman needs a man as much as a fish needs a bicycle. Then there is practical singleness, where you're single until you're married. Or you are between marriages. Or you are after marriage, you've been widowed. Then there is also a kind of virtual singleness, where because one or both of those in a marriage are posted in different places in the military or are doing medical residencies in two different places, are virtually single. But here I'd like to focus on Christian singleness and this from a particular vantage point, and I'm going to call it ecclesiological, which pertains to the church. And I define this in this way with four parameters. It's by choice, it's for life, it's unto Christ, and it's in community. It's by choice, it's not forced. It's for life, it's not a temporary decision. It's unto Christ, not for any other purpose but to be serving Christ, and it is in community. It's not hiding under a rock or in a cave somewhere, but fully entrenched in community. My preference for this form of singleness is ecclesiological singleness or celibacy. By choice, for life, unto Christ, in community. Celibacy is a counter-cultural response from the inside to a personal calling by God. By calling, I mean it's the recognition of a gift, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Yet I wish that all men were married, even as I myself am. However, each one has his or her own gift from God, one in this manner, one in another. That means both marriage and celibacy are called gifts. I'm not denying that at all. I'm only saying that they are both gifts, but they are both different gifts. So celibacy, like marriage, is a response from the inside to a calling by God. As the theologian Stanley Grenz noted, an individual can never be celibate in a de facto manner. That is simply because he or she is not yet married or was previously married. Rather, the celibate person has chosen the single life as the best option for the fulfillment of personal calling. All that to say, ecclesiological singleness, celibacy, is different from other kinds of singleness. It's a deliberate choice in recognition of a gift, of a divine gift, not by accident, by virtue of life circumstances. 
It's a choice made for the entirety of one's life. It's a lifelong choice in order to serve Christ, not to make more money or to travel or to do some of the other things. And it's a lifelong choice of serving Christ in community. By choice, for life, unto Christ, in community. Ecclesiological singleness or celibacy. It's a different kind of singleness because it comes from a divine calling. When Jesus taught that the relationship between a husband and wife was permanent and indissoluble, the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, not to all, not all men can accept this statement, but only to those to whom it has been given. So there's a sense of givenness to it. But as we saw earlier, both marriage and celibacy are gifts that are given by God. However, I personally think that there are more people with the gift of celibacy who end up being married, not using their gift of celibacy, than the other way around, people with the gift of marriage, not using their gift of marriage and remaining single. Because of the cultural default, both within and outside the church, the cultural norm is marriage. And that has made celibacy, the celibate gift, less recognized and far less exercised. I would bet that there are more Christians to whom celibacy has, the gift has been given than we realize or acknowledge. Because of this givenness, because celibacy slash ecclesiological singleness is a gift, I'd like to make one more distinction here. And that is that celibacy is not the same as abstinence. Abstinence is a response from the outside to a circumstance, abstaining from sexual activity. Celibacy is a response from the inside to a divine calling, and it goes beyond just the giving up of sexual activity. It's more than abstinence. It's more than abandoning sex. In fact, celibacy comes from the Latin celebs, which means alone or unmarried or single. Yes, for a Christian, celibacy includes abstinence from sex, of course. But celibacy is not restricted to abstinence. The philosopher Max Scheller, not a Christian, argued that Christian asceticism had as its goal not the suppression of natural drives or even their extermination, but only power and control over them and their complete integration with soul and spirit. He called it spiritualization. It's positive, not negative asceticism, aimed at the liberation of the higher powers of personality from the inhibitory automatism of the lower drives. So also much of the early church fathers, they saw celibacy as having a greater goal than just simply abstaining from sex. They recognized celibacy to have a transcendent aim. Gregory of Nyssa in the fourth century argued that celibacy defined simply from a merely physical state of abstinence holds no value. He said, it is not a single achievement ending in the subjugation of the body, but that in intention it reaches to and pervades everything that is or is considered a right condition of the soul. That soul indeed, which in virginity, celibacy, cleaves to the true bridegroom will not remove herself merely from all body defilement in sexual activity. She will make that abstention only the beginning of her purity and will carry this security from failure equally into everything else on her path. That is to say, abstinence from sex is not the only aspect of a lifestyle of celibacy. Celibacy affects everything the celibate does or says or think. In the use of one's time, in the use of one's solitude, in the engaging of one's vocation, in the enjoyment of one's leisure, in the participation of one's relationships, in thought life, in everything. Just as if you're married, that governs everything you do. Just like that, celibacy also pervades every aspect of your life. But in a world that is besotted by, obsessed by sex, I think the church has unfortunately lost its way. She too has fallen into the trap of conceiving of this drive and its fulfillment as one of the greatest goods and ends of mankind, sex. 
the evangelical wing of Christendom, of which I am part, gives scant regard to sexual abstinence, forget celibacy and singleness. This despite biblical and historical emphases on the singleness as a valid course of life. So for the rest of our time, I want to make the case that celibacy reflects the gospel in the broadest sense of gospel as in the plan of God for mankind both now and eternally. Pope John Paul II said, celibacy for the kingdom of heaven is characterized by successive self-sacrifices throughout the breadth of one's life. Sacrifices of family life, sacrifices of legacy, sacrifice of security that comes from family, sacrifice of sex, companionship, all sacrifices for the body of Christ, including sacrifice of time, ability, resources that are now devoted to the church. And of course, the gospel also in its broadest sense is also characterized by self-sacrifice as Jesus exhorted. If anyone wishes to follow after me, he or she must deny himself, herself, take up his cross and follow me. So the first way in which celibacy reflects the gospel in its broader sense is that both are characterized by self-sacrifice. Celibacy is characterized by self-sacrifice. But this world knows nothing of sacrifice, doesn't it? Forget successive self-sacrifices, as Pope Paul said. It cannot even conceive of giving up sex. Sex is seen as a biological imperative that cannot be denied. Congresswoman Barbara Lee once declared, an abstinence until marriage program is not only irresponsible, it's really inhumane. Andy Rooney said, the fact is, sex is in something a person can decide to have or promise not to have. They might as well have ordered church bells not to ring when struck. Freud radically transformed the way Western civilization conceived of sex. Suddenly, sexual satisfaction became the sign of a normal, healthy person. Those who did not engage in sexual activity were suspect. What neuroses were they harboring? We suspect celibates by fostering their repression of their sexual desires. And needless to say, popular culture has taken off on this. In a movie that came out several years ago, 40 Days and 40 Nights, the main character, Matt, Josh Harnett, tries to give up sex for Lent, and here is his roommate's response. You can't do it. I'm just saying no man can do it. It goes against nature. It goes against science. Do you want to be the man who goes against science? This is not normal. Bad enough, the world says, to be single and die alone, but to die without ever having had sex? How tragic. Unfortunately, Christians aren't exempt from this attitude either. In fact, Luther echoed these sentiments half a millennium ago while talking of sex. The person who wants to keep nature from doing what it wants to do and must do is simply preventing nature from being nature fire from burning, water from wetting, and man from eating, drinking, or sleeping. Sounds like Andy Rooney. You can't prevent it. But sex, if you didn't know it already, is a biological, is not a biological imperative. It's a drive. You might not believe it, but not having sex won't kill you. I think I'm still alive. So in short, celibacy reflects the gospel, firstly, because at its core, it is self-sacrifice, just as with the gospel. On the other hand, if they were essential, sex and marriage would have persisted into the eternal state, but they do not. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. So marriage, folks, is not an eternal institution. That in itself tells me that marriage is not the summum bonum, the greatest good of the Christian life. That's why you don't find sex in marriage in the eschaton, in eternity. Now you might ask, what about Genesis 2.18 where the Lord said, It's not good for the man to be alone, I'll make him a helper suitable for him. While well, Genesis 2.18 does commend the goodness of man plus woman, I don't believe that it is merely telling us something about the goodness of marriage. What is not good is the aloneness being by oneself, the separateness, the lack of community is what is being 
and rest here. Without community, individuals are incomplete. And of course, when there's only Adam on the scene for community to be formed, marriage is essential, hence Genesis 2.18. Remember the all-important mandate that God gave man and woman in Genesis 1.27 and 28. God created man in his own image, male and female, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule. And to fulfill this communal mandate, God creates an institution, marriage. Not an end in itself, but simply a means to an end. And one does not have to be married to be part of this community. In fact, as I noted, ecclesiological singleness is characterized by being one characteristic is that it is an integral part of community, by choice, for life, unto Christ, and in community. On, on that note, let me run through a few verses in the New Testament that focus on the importance of community, perhaps even over family. Jesus asked rhetorically in Matthew 12, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. And how about all those verses on hating one's parents and spouses and children to love God totally? anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. This does not sound like the stuff of family values here. And take a look at what Jesus said to John, his disciple, as he was hanging on the cross about the care that he expected to be given to his mother. He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son, pointing to John. Then he said to the disciple, John, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Now, this is interesting. You know why? Jesus had relatives, brothers and sisters, who would have been expected to take care of their mother. But rather than depending on these biological ties, Jesus turns to one of his disciples essentially asking that she, his mother, be cared for by the Christian community that would rise up around John and the rest of the disciples. And so with that statement, Jesus places this Christian community over the nuclear family. So in this dispensation of sin and evil, the New Testament seems to be more inclined towards singleness than marriage as an ideal like Paul. But there was celibacy way before Paul extolled its virtues. Jeremiah says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, You shall not take a wife for yourself, nor have sons or daughters. Others, of course, in that mold include John the Baptist and Paul and possibly Timothy and Luke and Barnabas and among the ancients, St. Augustine, Francis of Assisi, Aquinas, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Bernard of Clairvaux, and among the moderns, John Stott, Amy Carmichael, Isaac Watts, Handel, Corrie ten Boom, Florence Nightingale, Phillips Brooks, and of course, Jesus himself. So firstly, again, celibacy is a form of self-sacrifice just as the gospel is. In that sense, it parallels the gospel. What is characteristic of all of these remarkable people that we saw listed is their resonance with Jeremiah's words. Your words were found and I ate them and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart for I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. This verse from Jeremiah reminds us that despite everything that you can find in the Song of Solomon, the key to a joyful life is not found in our family arrangements, but in a relationship with God, in utter God dependence. And of course, the gospel in its broadest sense is also characterized by utter God dependence as Jesus asserted, I am the wine, you are the branches. The one who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So this is the second way in which celibacy reflects the gospel in its God dependence. Firstly, it is self-sacrifice, and so it resembles the gospel that way. Secondly, it is characterized by God dependence, and so it reflects the gospel that way. 
So although union in marriage reflects the intimacy between Christ and his bride, the church, marriage is only an incomplete and dimly reflected mirror of the ultimate intimacy that will be fully satisfied only with God himself at the end of this divine love story in heaven. The church is the only institution God promised to sustain forever and God created marriage to point to the church and its ultimate relationship to God. On the other hand, when marriage is seen as the source of happiness here on earth on this side of eternity, it's no wonder that many find themselves on an endless path of multiple failed marriages in search of that one that guarantees happiness. Irma Bombeck, the humorist, once said, marriage has no guarantees. If that's what you're looking for, go live with a car battery. So the second way in which celibacy reflects the gospel is in its guard dependence. It's a refusal to over-romanticize marriage. It's a recognition that nothing, not things, not persons, not places, nor actions can fully satisfy our deepest needs. Only God can. And it is upon Him and upon Him alone that we all, single or married, should depend. No, humans were not made with a spouse-shaped hole that only a wife or a husband can occupy. We were made for God. As Andre Nouven said, no human being can understand us fully. No human being can give us unconditional love. No human being can offer constant attention. No human being can enter into the core of our being and heal our deepest brokenness. In other words, if you're looking for somebody like that to understand you fully and to give you unconditional love and to offer constant affection and enter into the core of your being and heal your deepest brokenness. If you're looking for a spouse like that, you can be sure that Hauerwas's law will operate. Stanley Hauerwas said, you always marry the wrong person. There is no such thing as Mr right or miss right because only God can meet that need or as as Socrates once said by all means marry if you get a good spouse you'll be happy if you get a bad one you'll be a philosopher <laughs> so celibacy this is how it is reflecting the gospel in its second aspect it's God dependent self-sacrifice God dependent ultimately the question revolves around our definition of happiness in this world are we perhaps ignoring a deeper issue as we focus so intently on fulfilling our desires for love and sex and companionship here on earth? Shouldn't we be primarily called, aren't we primarily called to be contented and fulfilled in God, as Jeremiah said? Again, we were not made with a spouse-shaped hole for a spouse to fill. We were made for God, as Augustine said, you have made us for yourself and a heart is restless until it rests in you. So that we can, without distraction, love God primarily and totally. This is why Kierkegaard said God wanted celibacy because he wanted to be loved. Loved without divided attention. Loved without preoccupation. Loved without competition. So again, secondly, in its God-dependence, celibacy parallels the gospel. So celibacy is much more than just abstaining from sex. It's an acknowledgement that we have offered ourselves completely in utter dependence, that utter God-dependence that reflects the gospel. The deepest desires of our heart need to rest, not in these temporal daily realities of marriage and family, but rather in our eternal reality of a relationship with God. Celibacy is self-sacrifice. Celibacy is God-dependence. Thirdly, sex and death go hand in hand. They are integrally related in the cycle of life. Birth and death birth and death. Sex and death are allies because in a world in which everyone dies, humanity needs sexuality to procreate in order to survive. So whether you like it or not, sex is an acknowledgement of death. 
By contrast, a confident Christian celibacy based on the hope of a resurrection of a body that will not, will never die, is a bold witness to the total defeat of death. I can be single. I don't have to procreate because there is a resurrection and then I will never die. So celibacy, I submit, is in this sense a symbol of our eternal state. The gospel also, in its broadest sense, looks forward keenly to an eternal relationship with God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So here's the third way in which Celibacy reflects the gospel. Both are characterized by an eternity focus. Celibacy, maintaining an eternity focus, reflects the gospel. Because you see, for the celibate, there is no safety net for the, of children. There is no safety net of memories being carried on by offspring. If we singles live on, it will be simply because there is a resurrection. If singles are remembered, they will only be remembered by God's eternal family, the church. That's why John Piper said, the family of God grows not by propagation through sexual intercourse, but by regeneration through faith in Christ. Marriage is temporary and finally gives way to the relationship to which it was pointing all along, Christ and the church. So celibacy reflects the gospel in its eternity focus. Of course, marriage is a picture of the church and the relationship with her bridegroom, Christ. No question. But when you see celibacy as a symbol of the church's eternal state, when we are in perfect communi communion with God, then and only then will we have a more complete view of the church. Both marriage and singleness are symbolic of our relationship with Christ. Either by itself is an incomplete picture. Father, Raniero Cantala Mesa, who is the preacher to the papal household, has been for the last two or three decades, is the only person permitted to preach to the Pope directly, declared. Celibacy is not ontologically, i.e. in itself, a more perfect state, but it is an eschatologically, in the future, more advanced state in the sense that it is more like the definitive state towards which we are all journeying. And likewise, writer Lauren Winner affirms singleness prepares us for the other piece of the end of time, the age when singleness trumps marriage. Singleness tutors us in our primary heavenly relationship with one another, siblings in Christ. Let me pause here for a few minutes to outline some of the freedoms of celibacy. There is biological freedom, freedom from the biological compulsion to have sex, to live by limiting one's desire. It's a spiritual discipline that sees satisfaction only in God for all things. There is provisional freedom in order to focus on God's total provision. Only He provides and He provides for all that we need. There is a sociological freedom from the sociological compulsions of family, freedom for the church, the ability to give one's time and one's resources to the body of Christ. Celibacy also therefore gives us a passional freedom, passion to suffer without endangering loved ones. And of course, there is also emotional freedom, freedom from an exclusive family love, freedom to demonstrate non-inclusive love to brothers and sisters in Christ. You could look at it this way. The marriage metaphor depicts God's exclusive, exclusive love for his people. And that's reflected in the exclusive, indissoluble love between spouses. On the other hand, the celibacy metaphor depicts God's all-inclusive love that invites everybody to participate, reflected in the freedom celibates have to love those in the family of God. Both are essential for a complete picture of God's love. So, in short, celibacy represents the gospel in self-sacrifice, in God-dependence, and in an eternity focus. I can understand when the world doesn't get any of this, but I'm 
totally at a loss when it is the church that fails to comprehend these truths. Today I was being interviewed in a podcast with uh, Dr. Timothy George and he asked me what I thought was the philosophy of celibacy in evangelical churches today and my tongue-in-cheek answer was this, saved, single, second class. Ever since Luther, a celibate monk, broke away from the Catholic Church and married a celibate nun, Katerina, we Protestants, we children of the Reformers, have looked askance at celibacy as a way of life to serve Christ. We evangelicals primarily have traditionally viewed marriage as the cure for aloneness and temptation. And such thinking permeates sermons and Christian literature and the very ethos of our churches, unfortunately. For example, take Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins' Left Behind series. 16 books, several of which hit the New Times bestseller list, selling over 65 million copies and four movies. The, the uh, series won the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association Pinnacle Award. Jerry Falwell said about the first book in the series, in terms of its impact on Christianity, it's probably greater than that of any other book in modern times outside the Bible. Left behind, second only to the Bible. This series describes the experience of four people left behind after the rapture. No matter what your theological persuasion, just follow along with me. They are, <laughs> they are Rayford, Chloe, Buck, and Bruce. And the four people come to Christ and these singles, they're single, band together to fight the Antichrist. So far so good. Singles can apparently stand effectively against evil in these times of trial. Unfortunately, the sequel negates all of this and degenerates into a formulaic romance novel. Buck and Chloe fall in love. In fact, when the Antichrist figure offers Buck a seductive career opportunity, what keeps Buck from succumbing is romantic thoughts of Chloe. That's what keeps him from falling into temptation. Then we have a new character, Amanda, who soon becomes Rayford's love interest. And then a double wedding takes place for Rayford and Amanda and Buck and Chloe. What follows are several sentimental passages where Rayford finds himself feeling more whole now that he has a wife. And Buck gushes about how Chloe was the greatest gift God had ever granted him. And Bruce? He remains single, the poor sap. <laughs> he, uh, he ends up in Indonesia as a missionary contracts an unknown virus, slips into a coma, and while in hospital, his hospital is bombed in a terrorist attack. And Bruce dies. <laughs> I get the distinct impression that all of this implies that only married couples could possibly have the fortitude to withstand the tribulation of the last day. Singles might as well roll over and die. Maybe that's why less than a quarter of those hundred million singles in our country go to church. Only a quarter, less than 25% of them go to church. What a need. Stanley Horowitz of Duke said, every time Christians make a fetish of the family, you can be sure they don't believe in God anymore. I, I may not go that far, but I wonder. I have to agree that there is at least one sure sign of a flawed vision of the Christian family when it denigrates and dishonors singleness. Look at what Luther said of celibates. They cannot boast that what they do is pleasing in God's sight, as can the woman in childbirth, even if her child is born of wedlock. Did you get that? Fornication, according to Luther, is better than celibacy. He had a very poor opinion of single men. Single men cannot be trusted very far. Even married men have all they can do to keep from falling into adultery. With single men, one can have neither hope nor confidence, but only constant fear. Not that single women fared any better. A woman has no control over herself. God has made her body to be with men, to bear children, to raise them, as the words of Genesis 1 clearly state. 
the general view of Protestant church is that marriage trumps celibacy. Just look at church bulletins. They're full of Sunday school classes for engaged couples, married couples, married couples with preschoolers, married couples with teenagers, married couples who are empty nesters, father-daughter campouts, mother-daughter tees, father-son baseball games. The church has bought into the philosophy of the world. But rather than going contra mundum, against the world, we are pro mundum, for the world. Marriage and sex are idealized while celibacy is denigrated. Tim LaHaye of Left Behind fame calls marriage, celibacy, an idealistic and unnatural standard. Al Mohler, unfortunately, is not far behind. Scripture makes it clear that saint-making will be done largely through our marriages. And likewise, Gary Thomas. Gary Thomas has an excellent book on marriage called Sacred Marriage. He says, Marriage is the preferred route to becoming more like Christ. And he goes on to say, if you want to become more like Jesus, I can't imagine a better thing to do than get married. Poor, single, celibate Jesus. He must not have been very Christ-like. <laughs> Listen, aren't all, all Christians being transformed into his image from glory to glory. Yep, this is what the church thinks of singles, saved, single, and second class. Several years ago, the academic dean at my institution, Dallas Theological Seminary, organized faculty and spouse get-togethers in different parts of town based on where we lived. The dean's office would provide the meats, the others would, those who were meeting would provide the carbs and greens and stuff. You know what that program was called? Dinner for eight. Except when I was there, it would have to be seven or nine. Clearly, I was the oddball, the anomaly. Saved, single, and second class. John Piper boldly goes against this grain. I am declaring the temporary and secondary nature of marriage and family over against the eternal and primary nature of the church. I fear we have idolized the family, idolized marriage. And I'll say it again. Celibacy represents the gospel in self-sacrifice, God dependence, and eternity focus. There resides within us a need that will never, never be satisfied here on earth. A holy longing that ultimately will be satisfied only on the other side of eternity. Until then, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Whether we are celibate or married, we need have no doubt about God's ability to provide. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. It doesn't say no good thing does he withhold from those who are married or those who are single, but from those who walk uprightly. And likewise, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they who seek the Lord, not they who are married or they who are single, they who seek the Lord will not be in want of any good thing. Are single Christians doomed to be incomplete, containing within them an emptiness? Isaiah says, fear not, for your husband is your maker whose name is the Lord of hosts. That's a, that's a commander-in-chief term, Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of the armies of heaven. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called God of all the earth. Therefore, I can be celibate because it reflects the gospel in self-sacrifice, God-dependence, eternity focus. So let the eunuch not say, Behold, I am a withered tree. For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who choose that which pleases me and hold fast my co covenant. To them I will give a name better than sons and daughters, an everlasting name I will give them which will not be cut off. 
celibacy, self-sacrifice, God dependence, eternity focus. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Caravilla. Well, we have time for questions, discussion. Does anyone have a question you'd like to ask? You can ask anything you want. I reserve the right not to answer, <laughs> but you can ask whatever you want. Feel free. So is celibacy equated with full-time ministry in the church? Not necessarily. In, in my case, it is, but I do have another life. I have another job. I'm a dermatologist in my other life, but I'm full-time at the seminary. No, that's not necessarily so, but you, you could, in a sense, be full-time in whatever vocation you are working at. You may not be making the money from ministry, which is what the usual definition of full-time ministry is, but I think every Christian is in full-time ministry in that sense. Um, in your years um, leading up to your decision to stay celibate, um, did you ever like have a strong desire to be married? Like growing up, did you have an expectation that you would eventually get married? Yeah, I think that probably was there in the back of my mind that someday I would, not, not as a conscious yearning or desire, but hey, that's what, that's what everybody does. There wasn't anything particularly more than that. I'll keep my answers brief so you can uh, ask more questions, or if you want to follow up, feel free to do that as well. Hey, can you talk a bit more about here? Because you talk, we talked about it at dinner a bit, where you grew up, and uh, so how you discern that that call, the gift. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, like any other gift, uh, and this probably goes for any gift that you may want to consider, whether you have or not. A useful grid is to think about your head, your heart, and your hands. Head, heart, hands. Head is who are you. What has God made you? What are the fingerprints that he has left in your life in the past? Relating it to my decision to be celibate, well, I'm content with solitude. In fact, I might even prefer solitude. I'm happy that way. That's how God has built me. In terms of experiences in the past, I grew up in my teenage years. I was in India, and courtship and dating were not a thing you did there and then. So I never had that experience, which may have, if I had, that may have made singleness or deciding to be single a little harder. I never had that. So I, I can already see God's, he's been working. Usually for an Indian conservative family, like the one I come from, family pressure is also pretty high to get married. That wasn't the case for me. My mother died when I was 22. She died of cancer and my father decided to remain single. He was not going to get married. So about five years after that, when I decided once and for all that I would remain single, he did not have any trouble at all because he himself had decided to be single for the rest of his life. So all of those things had been God's working in my life, who I am, circumstances of my life. That's my head. The heart. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, if you're burning, get married. If you cannot control your sexual desires, get married. My mind wasn't under control. It wasn't anything more than normal. It wasn't anything that I could not keep under control. Plus, my passion was to throw myself into study of the Word of God with, a, with an undivided attention, without preoccupation. So that was my heart. And then my hands, as I was doing those things, it bore much fruit. So all three things, my head, who I am, personality, life experiences, heart, my feelings, my passion to go this way, and the fruit it was bearing, my hands, led me to seriously consider whether celibacy was my gift or not. Yeah, plus prayer and a lot of seeking advice from people I loved and who, whom I knew, who I knew cared for me. Yeah. 
I, th I think he's going to come with the microphone. Um, what are your thoughts on celibacy and adoption? I've never given it much thought, so. I, I, I am giving it much thought now. <laughs> it, it, it depends on your goal for celibacy. I, I really think if anybody is speaking celibacy, you should have an overriding passion in your life. That should be your drive. For me, it is just the study of God's word and preaching. That's it. That's overtaken my life. For what I am doing, that would probably not work, adoption. But maybe your passion is to take care of children who have been abandoned. Whatever. That may be valid. If that's the case, I might even ask, well, wouldn't they be better off if you were married? So that's something you may want to consider for the sake of the ones you're adopting. Yeah, but I, I leave that to people who are interested in that. Because now you're involving another life in your celibacy life, celibate life, and you may want to consider whether it would be healthier for the children to have a nuclear family. Uh, but besides that, I, I think that's a fair enough uh, opportunity. You'll have to do more thinking on that too. <laughs> it's good, it's a good question. Um, how would you recommend, or do you have any, have you given any thought to how the church can value singles better so that singleness doesn't become this pariah type attitude, but where congregations are you know, married and single, and that's not weird. I would love for that to happen. I, I have not experienced it. I'm, I think of myself as I'm driving a car, but I'm building a road as I drive the car. I'm feeling my own, I, I don't have any role models. I, haven't, I don't have a community of singles that I can there, are, there is a singles ministry in our church, but that's simply single until. Uh, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for by choice, for life, unto Christ in community. So, and, and you know, at the seminary, a lot of students engage me in this. At the beginning of every semester, they, in every course, I introduce myself as being celibate, and I say that's an integral part of who I am. I'm open to talking about it, engage me after class sometimes. So many take me on. We go for coffee or something and talk about it. My advice is, to them is not that they remain celibate, but know your gift and go with that gift. That's all I ask. And so I would recommend those who are going to ministry who are married just be, to be aware that there are probably many people with the gift of celibacy who may not know it, who think that the default pathway being marriage, that's what's expected of them. And this option, this possibility, this consideration of celibacy as a valid, equally valid, not higher than marriage, not lower than marriage, equally valid platform for serving Christ is available. They may not even know that. And I just, like pastors and youth ministers and staff on churches, just to keep that option open for the flock. So you talked about uh, this is not just isolation, but it's about being celibate in community. So I'm curious what that looks like for you as much as you'd like to share, whether that's sort of with your local church, with your school community, um, if you live alone or if you have some sort of roommates that you live with or if you live with family, just how you cultivate that community and don't just sort of isolate yourself. Okay, that's, that's a good question. I have, I have care of a 91-year-old father, so I live in a house by myself where I can care for him. My brother and I share him uh, over a year's time. So I live alone, so I don't have roommates. But, and I'm by nature more solitary, so I have few friends, but I keep them very close. They are all married, because I know that I need to be in community, and celib a celibate individual is not a, an individual without a gender. I have a gender, I'm masculine. I need the interaction with the opposite sex. Not an intimate relation, but I need that. So all of my friends, close ones, are married couples. I don't have my keys with me, but in a church that I interim pastored, I grew very close to one couple. I still have their house keys on my keychain. I don't think I've ever used it, but it's there for the last 15 plus years. 
It's there because I know I can go in any time I want to. Uh, very close. So there are people in the church that I'm close to. There's a small group that I attend. Uh, there are one or two faculty members in our m the department that I serve in at Dallas Seminary who are very close to me and who know everything that's going on. My brother, my older brother, my only sibling is the one who led me to Christ. Uh, he has, those of you who are technical know this, he has durable power of attorney over me, which means I don't have to be incapacitated or to die. He can take every penny I have anytime he wants to. I'm accountable to him completely. Um, so I make myself open and accountable to a few people close who know everything that's going on in my life. Uh, in that sense, community. Um, I'm, I'm an integral part of my church. I'm not on staff or anything, but I preach in the summers quite often. And so those are my activities. Plus, of course, seminary life is uh, demanding. Wes Hill talks a lot about uh, the meaning of, of being a godparent. Um, could you speak to baptism's representation of the family in in adopting even even singles and for him in his case a gay celibate man um, into the life of a true family in the church yeah i think that's very appropriate i think i have been though we may not have used the same language of adoption uh, i think i have been adopted by that family who gave me their keys i think my brother and my sister-in-law have adopted me i always get plenty of good food whenever <laughs> whenever they visit me or i go i get truckloads to take home with me because they know this single guy doesn't know how to cook. <laughs> uh, so, so those close friends keep an eye open for my back. And I, I think that's, we may not, we may not use rebaptisms or that sense of the word. And I also, in, in another, another sense, I also get to adopt. I have two nephews. Um, they're like my sons. Um, we've done uncle, nephew trips all across the world even very recently with the youngest nephew who's now 27 years old. He and I took a driving trip to the North and South Islands of New Zealand last month. I said I was going and asked him if he wanted to come. He said, sure. <laughs> I like to think that a 27-year-old guy doesn't think that his uncle is an old fogey. And, you know, it's not a shame to travel with him. So yeah, so they're like my, my boys. So we're very close. So I in turn have kind of sort of adopted them that family, my brother's family, as well as a few other close families have, in a sense, adopted me, though we haven't. I haven't addressed the whole issue of, you know, and he's right on that count. If you are homosexual, then you really don't, in a biblical sense, have a choice. You have to be celibate. And that is not my case. I'm heterosexual, but I've chosen to be celibate anyway. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm a student at Beeson, and I was once at a crossroads where I had to choose between becoming a medical doctor or a theologian. And I noticed from your bio today in chapel that you said, well, why not both? And um, I see you're also an interim pastor. So can you talk a little bit about um, how being celibate opens up more vocational possibilities for you and how I, one day as a pastor, can guide singles in my church to becoming more vocationally active since they are afforded the opportunity to do so. Yeah, it's an incredible freedom. You know, if you're married, decisions are made by committees. <laughs> I can go or not eat or go out and eat or eat wherever I want to. But it's not just those mundane things. I can throw my life into the body of Christ completely, uh, which is apart from my practice, the rest of my life is completely spent in writing, teaching, preaching. I don't do anything else. I don't want to do anything else. This is absolutely exhilarating for me to give myself with the total abandon to Christ. It's just great. I would not want to do anything else. My medical practice, which I don't do much of, it's very, you know, couple of half days, maybe three half days a week, is a hobby. I'm, not, I'm just doing it for fun. I need, you know. The good thing is nobody dies of athlete's foot and acne. 
So dermatology is the only one where you can, have, you can do it as a hobby. It's great. I can see my patients leave and not have to worry about them at all. <laughs> no other doctor can do that. So it's not that demanding if that's what you meant, it's not, except for the bureaucratic tangles that I get into with Medicare and licensing and annual renewal of license and continuing medical education. Yeah, that kind of stuff is a little troublesome, but, but beyond that, it's not that demanding. So there's plenty of time, and I, I'm very careful with the hedges around me. I don't get involved in things that somebody else can do better. Just because I like to do it, no, I'm not doing it. I'm doing things that God wants me to do. I have a short life. I've got to focus on things that I can do well. So I don't take on too many things. I'm very careful with what I take. So I'm extremely cautious about time management and get involved only in things that I think I can contribute effectively to. But, but I, I think the time issue is the biggest freedom. In marriage, you are called to spend time with your family. That's your calling. That's, your, that's the way God wants you to spend your time. If you're single, God wants you to spend your time, if you're celibate Christian single, with the eternal family of God. That's all. It, they're not necessarily one. It's not better than the other. There's just two different kinds of spending your time. Do you know if celibacy in, per se, the global south or the 1040 window just outside of American Christianity, is celibacy as prominent of, a, of something going on or is it just kind of here? Uh, celibacy is a little more prominent among religions that are non-Christian. Hinduism, for instance, puts a big stock in celibate Hindu saints or holy men, so to speak. However, I, I think in less affluent countries, it's a little bit more difficult, especially for women, to remain single. Simply because of the way society is structured in terms of earnings and wages and societal pressures and stigma. Uh, it's a little, it's probably easier for us in the Western Hemisphere to, especially for women who want to be single. That may be the big difference. Any other questions? Ask as many as you want, depending on time, of course, and I'll let Grant handle that. Uh, just can you talk a little bit about, since you are an occasional interim pastor, how have churches reacted to your celibacy? Uh, there have been situations where sight unseen they have rejected me because I'm single. Which is not uncommon. I have many students of mine who are single who apply for the pastor at the moment they hear they're single. They're taken off consideration. It's part of the bias that we have saved single and second class. I remember there was a book publisher who interacted with me once and we had lunch about a book that I was writing and then he casually asked me how do you, he, that he finds it amazing that a single like me can remain pure. So from that time onwards, every time there has been a pastor or somebody falling morally, I copy that link and send it to him with the question, simple question underneath, was this person married or single? I have yet to find a single person who has fallen like that. So the bias is considerable. They think that single men, I don't know what he thinks of single women, probably the same, are incapable. This is the Christian understanding. We are incapable of controlling this and therefore we need to get married. The earlier the better. Something really sad about that. So yes, there is that bias. Uh, in my own church, that's not a problem. I think after once they know you and see who you are, and I also have some credibility because I'm a prof at a seminary in town, so there's some added. But my students do suffer. There are single male students who apply for pastorates who are single. No, they're not even interviewing you. Yeah. 
Uh, time for a few more? Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks a ton for your transparency. Um, just curious, if uh, a woman crosses your path who's Christian, single, you're attracted to her, uh, in some ways you feel like you're a more godly person of yourself around her, you develop some attraction to her, how do you navigate going forward with singleness being intentional and lifelong? I, I, I don't allow those situations to happen. Hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't socialize with the opposite sex alone. Hmm. I, I just don't do that. Because there are wonderful Christian women around. If I left that door open, the possibility of such a thing happening, I would be looking at, oh, is this person God bringing into my life? Is that person God bringing into my life? This is, I wouldn't be able to function. Because <laughs> I would always be wondering if God is bringing that person into my life to tell me to get married. I can't, I can't function. So I said, you know what? Life is short. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to shut that door firmly. Closed. Done. Hmm. My sister-in-law did try to set me up multiple times, but <laughs> <laughs> she has given up now. Uh, yeah, I, it's a short life. Mm -hmm. The question is, what do you do with your gift? What do you do with God has, what God has entrusted you with? He doesn't ask us to be successes. He asks us to be faithful to what he has given us. Stewards of everything. Gift, body, resources, time, money, whatever. Faithfulness is what's called for. Not grand sensations and successes. That's how we'll be judged. And life is short. Can I ask one follow-up? Certainly. Right. Um, how do you, as someone who your singleness being intentional, lifelong, uh, sacrificial, how do you counsel the man or woman who longs for marriage, hasn't found it? Um, I'm thinking back to your early on the slideshow, kind of the list of all the different ways you can be single. And the last was the ecclesial or Christian. Um, but one was, uh, was it practical? Thanks. Uh, where someone longs to be married and sure. simply isn't. How do you kind of counsel them? Yeah, that, that may be, and I think the best example is to go back to Wesley Hill. I don't know whether he wanted in his heart of hearts to be single, but he admits to being homosexual in orientation, and therefore he has chosen to be single. So there's something else that has cost him to be, and he's a professor in a seminary. So there's some other factor that has caused him to be single. I think that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That too may be part of God's working in your head. Likewise, maybe if you haven't found Mr. Right or Miss Right, is there, is there a possibility that that's part of your, that's God's fingerprint on your life? It's possible. So I think we should be open to the possibility that the gift of celibacy, I'm convinced this gift of celibacy is given to many more. Mm -hmm. Perhaps explaining why there may be unsuccessful marriages. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't have the gift of marriage in the first place, or at least one of them didn't have. That's possible. Uh, okay, so I have another question. Um, so you mentioned earlier how uh, some people choose to um, Leave, lead the life of marriage because they don't believe that the life of celibacy is for them um, or they choose to believe that How, what would you say to somebody if they got married and then realized that God chose them for that life uh, it doesn't so, matter. like in terms of divorce and stuff like that not a problem stay where you are Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7 nothing happens unless God sovereignly wills it to happen if I fall and break a leg ultimately that's God's will so make the best of what situation you can. Life is short. Sure, we make mistakes. I may have decided, uh, I keep thinking preaching is my gift, but maybe it's not. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> so uh, likewise, you might think marriage is your gift and you find yourself in the wrong place. Married. It's all right. You, you know, God gives us grace, plenty of grace, abundant grace, to live through even errors that we make. Not a problem. He can see you through all that. That's how great our God is. It's a short life. It will be gone like that. Mm.